Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good Happy morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Danielle Byron and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Mm -hmm. Byron, will you pray for God's blessing on this morning's study? Yes, thank you, Victor. Let us bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you on this Sabbath day, Lord, with humble hearts. And Lord, we look to you for wisdom and for mm -hmm. knowledge, Lord, through your Word and through your Holy Spirit to open our minds that we may truly have knowledge of you. Lord, as we look at today's lesson, the rhythms of rest, we look at your Sabbath and how we should be and how you want us to be and just how you want to transform us through this process, Lord, Amen. that we may come closer to your image. Amen. Guide us each step of the way, Lord. Let each person watching this hear your words, that they truly might not only know you better, Lord, but that they put it into action in their lives and truly be the sons and daughters of the living God. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Byron. Well, as you already know, and uh, we already know, this quarter's lesson invites us to come and find rest in Christ. Resting in Christ is the key to the type of life that Jesus promised to his followers. In John chapter 10, verses 10, John 10, 10, we read, The thief does not come except to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come, however, says the Lord, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, rest in Christ connects us to salvation, to grace, to creation, to the Sabbath to our understanding of the state of the dead, to the sin coming of Jesus, and to so much more. This is why Christ appeals to us in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Verses 28 to 30 of Matthew 11, Jesus tells us, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, says the Lord, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What a promise. What a promise. This week's Sabbath School lesson, as Byron has already mentioned in his prayer, is the rhythms of rest. And the memory verse, the key verse for this week's study, is found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 3. And it says, Genesis 2, 3, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. A very brief commentary in this, in this particular verse tells us that because God rested on the Sabbath, he blessed it and he sanctified it. And what does that mean? It means that he set the Sabbath apart for holy use. It means that he gave the Sabbath to Adam and to the human race, to you and I, as a day of rest. And it became a memorial of the work of creation, and as such, a sign of God's power and his love. Now, as a brief summary for this lesson, a brief overview of this week's lesson, I want to make the following statements. I want to state here this morning, first and foremost, that the climax of all God's creation is the Bible Sabbath. As we all know from the first chapter of Genesis, during the first three days of creation's week, God created light, he formed the heavens and earth, and he created water and land and all kinds of plants. Then on the fourth day, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then during the next two days, God made the fish, other sea creatures, the birds, all kinds of land animals, and finally, the human being. The Friday afternoon, that Friday afternoon, after God had created the human beings, Adam and Eve, that's 
that, that, particular, that particular evening, I can see God. I can see God, Adam, and Eve explore the paradise home just before sunset. The scene must have been breathtaking and beyond description. As the sun slowly set on the Friday, the sixth day of creation, and the stars begun to appear, we are told in Genesis chapter 1, verses 31, Genesis 1, 31, that God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Yes, as beautiful as was the world that God had just completed, the greatest gift God could give to Adam and Eve, and to you and to me, to every human being, was the privilege of a personal relationship with him. So God gave them the Sabbath. God has given us the Sabbath, a day of special blessing, a day of fellowship, a day of communion with their Creator. On the seventh day, God Eloit, God set it apart as holy. The Sabbath comes to us from a sinless world. It is God's special gift enabling you and I, human beings, to experience the reality of heaven and earth. Therefore, the Sabbath is a day for human beings. It's a day for us to reverence God for the wonders of creation, to enjoy loving relationships with our families and our neighbors, and to enter into fellowship with God, our Creator and our Maker. This tells us that the Sabbath is central to our worship of God. In this week's lesson, The Rhythms of Rest, we will discover how the Sabbath is knit into the fabric of time as a memorial to our Creator for His gift to us of life, both temporal and perpetual, eternal. This week's lesson reveals that throughout the centuries, the Sabbath has been a memory, a memory aid for God's people, constantly reminding them of their Creator. In the Sabbath, we see faithfulness. If the Sabbath had been faithful, kept for each generation, there would be today no atheists, no agnostics, and no secular humanists. The Sabbath speaks of a God who creates us, a God who is concerned for us, and a God that cares for our daily needs. The Sabbath is also a reminder of the power of God to deliver. The all-powerful Creator delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt and can deliver us from the bondage of the sinful habits ab that enslaves us. On Sabbath, we rest in the blessing of the one who created us, of the one who redeemed us, of the one who sanctified us, and of the one who's coming again for us. The Sabbath is heaven's oasis of rest in the parched desert of our frenzied secular world. Danielle, Sunday's lesson is titled Prelude to Rest. What is this all about? Prelude to Rest. I'm supposed to talk about creation, and creation is supposed to be the prelude to rest, as I'm thinking to myself as I'm reviewing and preparing for this lesson. What is this, the apostrophe before the T? <laughs> uh, looking at creation is such an all-encompassing, uh, I mean, you can study in your entire life about creation and never finish. Um, but we're supposed to look at it. So let's look at creation account for a brief few minutes. So brief, it will feel like trying to see a massive, all-important, all-encompassing, all-defining events from a sh few short blinks. So the creative word and pre-existent matter. We're looking at creation. God said is what introduces the, introduce the di dynamic command on every step of creation. God said was in verse 3 of Gen Genesis 1, in verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, 14, 20, and 24. Every command started with God said. Each command came charged with a creative energy that transformed a planet without form and void into a paradise. 
He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Um, and it says so when we're looking at Psalm 33 with 9, it describes that creation that way. It says, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And then in Hebrews 11 with 3, it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So we are looking that this creative word was not pre dependent on pre-existent matter. It, he created by speaking, and he made matter by speaking. Of course, he did use matter to form and shape Adam and Eve and the animals, um, but that matter in itself was created right before by God. So creative word and no pre-existent matter. Mind-boggling. Mind then we're looking at the creation days, literal 24 hours. It's typical of how the Old Testament people of God measure time. It's like the expression, the evening and the morning. It's like repeated over and over seven, I mean six times in verses, in Genesis 1, verse 5, verse 8, verse 13, 19, 23, and 31. The days are clearly delineated. There is no ambiguity. It's not you know, trying to make out of this that it was over billions and millions of years. It's just day one, evening and morning, evening and morning. And the Hebrew word translated day in Genesis 1 is spelled yom, Y-O-M. Mm -hmm. When yom is accompanied by a definite number, it always means a literal 24 hours. Another indication of the creation account speaks of literal 24 day hours is the Ten Commandments. So let's look very quickly at uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. And I will read it and will point out where the time is also delineated here very clearly. Rem remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. So even within the, tenth, the, the, the fourth commandment, the time frame is clearly the uh, creation delineated. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and he rested on the seventh. So we are looking at a creation that's clearly identified, uh, structured in uh, day time frames. And all that, uh, what about the heavens? He created the heavens and the earth. So we are thinking, what are the heavens? The heavens in Genesis 1 and 2 probably refer to planets and stars nearest the earth. Indeed, the earth, instead of being Christ's first creation, was most likely his last one. The Bible pictures the sons of God, probably the atoms of all the unfallen worlds, meeting with God in some distant corner of the universe. If you wish to review, you can look up on your own Job 1, 6 through 12, where it indicates this meeting of the other worlds, people from the other worlds. Um, I'm not sure there are people. Beings, created beings from other worlds. And then from Genesis 1 through 2 and 26, we know that all the members of the Godhead were involved in creation. So that's another big part of creation. Who are these agents? We know in uh, Genesis 1, 2 and 26 that the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the face of the form and we know that God the Father was present in Christ. But we know that the active agent, however, was the Son of God, the pre-existing Christ, and we know that from previous studies in John 1, 1, 3, and John 1, 14, that Jesus was the creator, the one who spoke the earth in existence. And we have other texts in the Bible that also identify that, um, like Ephesians 3, 9, and Ephesians 3.9 says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So there's various texts through the Bible besides the most powerful ones that we always review that show us that Jesus was the one who spoke the earth 
into existence. A display of God's love. I mean, how deep, how deep is the God's love when Christ was, with loving care, was hovering over Adam, shaping Adam's hand, man's first hand, that hand that through the ages down was going to crucify him, was going to beat him, and was going to nail him to a cross. And with that, as he's forming Adam with that ominous future cloud of Calvary, he still continued forming Adam. Um, it's just, um, and he continued breathing the breath of life into his nostrils, knowing that this creative act would deprive him of his own breath of life. It's just incomprehensible love in the basis of creation. And the significance of creation, oh, this is quite a list, I can't even fully cover it, but I will highlight a few very important items of significance to us as people. Um, people are tempted to ignore creation, and sometimes people who don't want to dis debate the idea of uh, uh, evolution or creation, they say, what, who, who cares who created, uh, how God created the earth? What we need to know is how to get to heaven, and, but creation is an indispensable foundation since a number of fundamental concepts, biblical concepts, are rooted in the divine creations. A knowledge of God created the heavens and the earth can ultimately help one find his way to the new heaven and earth that John the Revelator speaks of. So let's review just a short brief list of this, and I'm gonna go fairly fast on this because it's a list. The antidote to idolatry. So creation is the antidote to idolatry. God's creatorship distinguishes him from all other gods. We should worship God, the God who made us, not the gods we made, which is a lot of the peoples of the earth bow down to the ones they made. The foundation of true uh, worship, our worship of God is based on the fact that he is our creator and we are his creatures. Um, the Sabbath, a memorial of creation, a sign between God and his people. Marriage was also made, a, it's a divine institution and it was instituted at creation during the creation week. The basis of true self-worth, the creation account states that we were made in God's image. This understanding leaves no room for a low estimate of ourselves. The basis of true fellowship. God's creatorship establishes his fatherhood and reveals the brotherhood of all humanity. He is our father, we are his children, thus we are brothers and sisters, and created in the image of God. Personal stewardship. Since God created us, we belong to him. This fact implies that we have the sacred responsibility to be faithful stewards of our physical, mental, and spiritual faculties, indeed. Responsibility to the environment, dignity of manual labor, I mean, Adam had to tend the garden, the worth of physical universe. At each stage of creation, God said it was good. When we're looking at Genesis 1, 10, 12, 17, 21, 25, he, everywhere he says every step of the creation was good. Thus, created matter is not in itself evil, but good. The Remedy of pessimism and loneliness and meaninglessness. We were created for a purpose, and that purpose was to be eternally with God. Life is sacred. Even David acknowledged that he, God continued to create. He created him. He creates each one of us. And because life is a gift from God, we have the moral duty to preserve it. Created in God's image, we have been called to glorify God. Ah, Amen. Creation, and this just covers the surface. Mm. Thank you, Danielle. Interesting that uh, from the revelation of creation, we now move into a commandment, a commandment to rest. So Byron, on Monday's lesson, God commands us to rest. Why? Well, let's look at this. First of all, let's look at Monday. We see six days of the lesson. We see six days of creation. And then a lot of times people just tack on the Sabbath day. Yeah. Well, God blessed it and he added, but it wasn't that eventful. And let's read Genesis 2, 1 through 3, first of all, just so we get God's word on this. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host. By the seventh day God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. 
And we see in verses 2 and 3, on the seventh day, it mentions that he blessed it, that it was holy, the seventh day, and that God rested. And that's it. That's all we have to go on. So let's take a look at this. Did God really need a break? No. I mean, six days, that was hard, but, you know. I know, and we, we know this for any of you thinking that he may have. In Isaiah 40, 28, do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. So God obviously wasn't tired. This is an example for us. And we're going to see just how, first of all, God was admiring his creation. And looking at what he had done. And second of all, he was spending time with his creation as well. We look at Adam, or at least Adam and Eve at this time. The apex of creation on the sixth day. God speaks everything, as Danielle mentioned, into existence. But with Adam, he gets down and personal. He molds him with his hands. He breathes into him the breath of life. And man becomes a living soul. With Eve, he takes the rib and some flesh, apparently, because Adam does say, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, um, and makes Eve. Now, we see this, that on the ha on basically it became a living soul. So on these days, when we look at it, a day is defined by an evening and a day. So what was so significant about the Sabbath day? Wasn't it just after number six? I mean, God didn't do anything special per se on that day, but he did bless it and he made it holy. Now, before he had Adam and Eve be caretakers for the Garden of Eden, before they did anything, what did they do with God? They rested. The most important instruction that God had for his new creation in his image was to rest with him on the Sabbath day and to spend time with him. Right. So, it's interesting because we underestimate the seventh day of the week sometimes. And you realize that this is actually something that, that is interwoven into our lives. I mean, we can see what's called the circadian rhythm. It's a 24-hour period, right? It's dictated by night and day. And our bodies adjust to it. All life does on this earth. It's woven into plants, animals, even fungi. So let's take a look at the number seven, though, because I'm going to suggest that the Sabbath is actually part of creation itself. When we look at this, there's something called the circumceptum rhythm or cycle. Ironically, that this, our, our thing is on the, our lesson this week is on the rhythms of rest, but it's a seven-day cycle. It's, it's perfectly scientific if you want to go look it up on the chronobiology um, and I have a reference here, even from, from the Chronobiology International, the Journal of Biological and Medical Rhythm Research. We see that basically in this pattern is present in all life forms from unicellular sea algae, and I'm quoting this, unicellular sea algae to plants, insects, fish, birds, and mammals, including man, end quote. But science are, scientists are baffled because they have no way of explaining a seven-day cycle, period. Now, a day we can explain with the sunrise and sunset, etc. A month we can explain with the lunar cycle. A year we can explain with the seasons. But how do you explain seven days? There is no reference in nature. And this is what has scientists perplexed. How did it come into being? You know, all you have to do is read the first cha few chapters of Genesis, and you know exactly how it came into being. So I would look at this, and I would actually say on day three, when God made plants, he had Sabbath in mind. On day five, when he created the fish and the birds, he had Sabbath in mind. On day six, when he created all the land animals and man, he had Sabbath in the plan of creation from day one. You even look at the number seven, just as a tidbit of knowledge. How, how many colors are there in a rainbow? Seven. How many unique notes are in an octave? Seven. 
is do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. But there's seven unique notes. Even in a honeycomb, in nature's perfection, there's six sides, right? So they all fit together nicely, but it has a seventh side, the bottom. That's just a few examples. So God's first instruction was how to rest, how to commune with him, to spend time with him, to be transformed more into his likeness. And you say, wait a minute, this was Adam and Eve. They were made in the image of God. They had room to grow. Because Ellen White writes before that if they had not sinned, they would have grown into so much more and realized the true beauty of God much more than they ever did at creation. So we got to look, how are we growing closer to that image of God? How are we using that sacred time of Sabbath and what are we doing with it? You know, God asks you for 14% of your week to spend with him. If we look at that time that we're awake, really it's about 10%. So with 10% of our time, we give 10% of our time, that's money. You know, your time is much more valuable than money ever is to God. We read Exodus 20, 8 through 11. And it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male or your female servant or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The word remember brings us back to creation, to that marker. It's almost like a landmark for creation itself. And the Creator whom we owe everything to. He made us with his own hands, as we said. We are his personal creation in his image. He set aside the Sabbath day for us to draw close to him, to put away the things of the world, and to focus on the things of God and our relationship with him. The Sabbath points to his majesty and power, to our omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God who guides us to salvation and will restore us to the original creation that we are intended to be, that we are made in so long ago. I just want to read one last thing from Ellen White, Christ in the Sabbath, page 23. The Sabbath has always been and always will be a sign of the power of God manifested through Christ. The reason given in the commandment for setting apart the seventh day as a Sabbath is that in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth and rested the seventh day. The Sabbath day, therefore, is a sign of creative power. This sign of creative power always calls our attention to the one who made the heaven and the earth. And it is true that if the Sabbath was, had always been kept, and this is as Victor said earlier, there would never, or there never would have been any false religion or idolatry, for the minds of men would have been constantly kept upon the true God, the creator of heaven and the earth, and as revealed in Jesus Christ. Remember that we are commanded to rest on the Sabbath because spending time with God on the Sabbath is truly essential to in transforming our characters and our, to the likeness of him, Amen. our Father in heaven. Amen. Byron, thank you so much. So much meaning in, 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 that, in that section of, of this week's lesson. Mm -hmm. um, Tuesday is a very interesting part of the Sabbath School lesson for this week, and I had the privilege to uh, study so that I could discuss it with you. And so our Tuesday lesson tells us that after 40 years, 40 years, of wandering in the desert, a new Israelite generation had grown up with virtually no memory or no memories of Egypt. They had a very different life experience from that of their parents. See, during these 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, this new generation, this new, um, um, brand new generation, if you like, 
had the opportunity and privilege to get to know God and understand His will in a very intimate way. God had promised to be their God. God had promised to take them to Himself as a people. And God had promised to lead them to the promised land. An incredible experience mm. that they went through. These 40 years in the wilderness provided Israel with new circumstances to learn of God, to believe in God, and to trust in God as they witnessed daily the continued evidence of His power. You see, in Exodus chapter 16 and verses 14 to 31, and we are not going to read all those verses, but in Exodus 16, 14 to 31, we see how God teaches Israel to trust Him as the sole provider of their own basic needs and to obey and worship Him as Lord and Creator of God. You see, thus we read in Exodus chapter 16, 15 and, and 16, uh, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, how the Lord provided Israel, uh, Israel daily with bread from, Hama, from, from heaven, manna. And, and, and those, two, those two verses read as follows, And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Verse 16, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, an omer, and that's about two quarts, for each person, according to the number of persons. And then it ends that, that particular verse by saying, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Every head of household was responsible to make sure that everybody ate. Scripture tells us in Exodus chapter 16, verses 35, that the children of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. I want you to think about that. That's an important verse. For 40 years. That probably means for 2,080 weeks. Or if you like, for 14,560 days, they were daily reminded by this miraculous provision of God's unfailing care and tender love. In the words of the psalmist, David, in Psalm 78, verses 24 and 25, Psalm 78, verses 24 and, and 25, David writes as follows, God gave them of the bread of heaven, and men ate angels' food. Oh, an incredible experience. See, through this daily provision of the bread of heaven, Israel were taught that having God's promise was as good as if they were surrounded by fields of waving grain, of waving grain on the fertile uh, plains of Canaan. The special food, the manna that God supplied, was a daily reminder that the Creator was committed to sustain His creatures, His creation. In a very tangible way, God was supplying their needs. Every day was a miracle with manna appearing during the early hours of the morning, only to see it melt, disappear with the sun. When anyone tried to hoard manna for the next day, it would rot and it would stink. But Israel was also taught to obey God and worship Him as our Creator God. In Exodus chap cha uh, chapter 16, verses 23 to 26, and verses 29 and 30, we read as follows. Exodus 16, 23 to 26, and 29 and 30, we read as follows. Then He said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until the morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, 
heat that day, for today is the Sabbath of the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. See? For the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man, every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. And then verse 30 tells us, so the people rested on the seventh day. These verses prove that the seventh day Sabbath predated the giving of the law of God at Sinai. Before the Israelites came to Sinai, they understood the Sabbath to be obligatory for them. They understood it to be a day of worship and a day of rest. Every week for 40 years in the wilderness, the Israelites witness a threefold miracle. A double quantity of manna fell on the sixth day. No manna fell on the seventh day, the Sabbath. And the portion needed for the Sabbath, which was picked up the day before, was preserved sweet and pure, as if it had been picked up that very morning. In being obligated to gather every Friday a double portion of manna in preparation for the Sabbath, the sacred nature of the day of rest was continuously impressed upon them. 2,080 weeks. But Israel was also privileged to have the sanctuary and God's presence in the center of their camp. At night, the pillar of fire assured them of the divine protection. During the day, they could see the cloud indicating God's presence hovering over the tabernacle. When it moved, when that cloud moved, they knew that it was time to pack and follow. This, um, this cloud that uh, provided shade during the day and light and eat at night was a constant reminder of God's love and God's care for them. As this new generation was poised to enter the promised land, and as Israel was about to undergo a change in leadership, Moses wanted to ensure that they would remember who they were and what their mission was. He did not want them to repeat the mistakes of their parents. Moses wanted to make sure that they continue to trust God, they continue to obey Him, to worship Him on the Sabbath day, just as He had taught them for 40, 40, 40 years. And so, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and I don't have time to do so, Moses reviews God's laws and restates the Sabbath command. This passage of Scripture, chapter 5, reminds the people that they were slaves in Egypt and that their almighty uh, Creator delivered them. You see, God is the only one who can deliver us from the bondage of sin. God is the only one who can break the chains that bind us. In reality, He is the message of the Sabbath. So what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is an almighty creator, our God, wanting to recreate your heart and my heart so that we may reflect his character. Mm -hmm. Danielle, Wednesday's lesson talks about reasons to rest. Unpack that for us. It's actually titled, Another Reason to Rest. Mm -hmm. So that's a little mind-boggling. Um, when we're looking at the Bible the, and at the Sabbath, the Sabbath was instituted when? At creation. It was observed by God, Adam and Eve, and all creation on the seventh day, right as creation has come to a completion. And then we follow through the history of the hum human race, and we follow through all the way till the Israelites end up in, is in, in Egypt, and then they are taken out. Obviously, they cannot keep the Sabbath as slaves in Egypt. And soon as they exit from uh, Egypt, they're going through the wilderness, they're being um, fed manna, 
Uh, we have not arrived to Sinai yet, and they're already being fed manna, and uh, being the Sabbath was already obviously in existence. And then we get to Mount Sinai, and God writes the, tab the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone, and that's written for us in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Re and let's read it together. We've read it several times today, but I'm going to highlight a few things in here because there's another opportunity to review the Ten Commandments, I mean the Fourth Commandment in the Bible. So the first time when God wrote it with his finger on the tablets of stone and Moses brought it down, and we read it, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's as if he's telling them, remember, it's, it was there all along. You just forgot it. But remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, and we know the rest, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates is all-encompassing. Why? Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. It's reminding them where it came from, that it is a memorial of creation, and it was instituted then. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So fine, we remember that. But there's another opportunity. As they're going through the wilderness, you know, we know the story where they uh, 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 got scared and disbelieved God and uh, they ended up roaming in the wilderness another 40 years. So here past 40 years and now we are after these 40 years in the wilderness and we are, they're getting close to the time to enter, finally enter Canaan. And Israel was camped outside on the eastern side of the Jordan. They came to the border with Moses and he, Moses, like a loving father, is saying his goodbyes. He is not going to enter Canaan. He's been told by God that he will not be entering because of past mistakes. And he is taking his time through the Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is a review, like a father getting ready to say goodbye to his kids, saying, remember to trust God, love God, obey God, obey his laws. And he's doing that through Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verses 12 to 15, he is repeating, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he's repeating the Ten Commandments, and he's telling them, obey God's law. And as he's doing that, he's repeating all the Ten Commandments, and he gets to repeat the Fourth Commandment. So this is where it is being repeated. So let's review it. It's mostly the same, but with a few very slight uh, comments that he adds before and after. He says, Observe the Sabbath day in verses 12, starting in verse 12. Verses in, in the original, it was remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. This is an add-on. It's like, why should you? Just, just as God commanded you, as the Lord your God commanded you, observe it. Six days you shall labor, and it continues with all the things we know already. But the seven days, the Sabbath day of the Lord your God in it, you shall do no work, nor your son, your daughter, and so on and so forth. It goes the same, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is in, within your gates. And then he adds that your male servant and your female servants may rest as well as you. It's an explanation for them. And remember, another explanation, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So he is adding an explanation to them because they have an added reason to rest. This God, not only did he create them, but with an outstretched arm and with a mighty hand saved them. It's a, another reason for them to rest. And that's what the title of the lesson is re revealing. Now, a really parenthesis that's very important for us to review is we have to always remember that this is not the original commandment, it's just an explanatory that he is doing, because otherwise it would be as if he was given just for the Israelites because the Lord took them out of Egypt. But this is a repeat explanatory for them as they're about to enter Canaan. The original is the one given, written for them on Exodus 20, 
8 through 11, and actually the original is the one at creation in Genesis. So it's a explanatory. So we always have to remember that because sometimes we are told, oh, it's just for the Israelites. And it's mistakenly taken because it's a repeat with an explanatory from Moses. Moses. Now, let's look at this very important uh, part. He's talking to a generation that's born in the wilderness. And why is he telling them to remember they were slaves? Because that, right, the ones that were born now, they were about to enter Canaan, were actually born in the wilderness. They were not born in slavery. However, he's basically telling them, you would have been slaves. Would it have been not for your God that took, you out, took your fathers out of, of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm? So you owe your salvation and the fact that you're not slaves to them. They are preparing to enter the promised land and Moses is pointing out that the same miracle needed to take them out of Egypt will be needed to enter Canaan. The first time around they didn't remember. They were only days after they had exited Egypt and when they were at the border of promised land they didn't believe the mighty hand of God could take them in. Now he is reminding them that this mighty hand, by repeating the mighty hand to come out of the slavery, this same mighty hand has the power to bring them into Canaan. And that same mighty hand has the power to take care of us and bring us through our Canaan uh, and our future. The Sabbath is also an added memorial of liberation of creation and redemption, being freed from being slaves to sin. It's a symbol of creation, a symbol of redemption. As literal Israel was delivered from bondage of Egypt, so we today have been set free from the bondage of sin. And I'd like to look with, together at Romans 6, 16 through 18. It states, and this is the Apostle Paul talking to the early church, and he says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And, and the most important part, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. So we have been Amen. freed from sin by becoming slaves to righteousness. The Sabbath thus becomes for us Christians a memorial not only of creation but of recreation of the image of God in my own heart and mind. First, a reason to rest, to remember God is our creator, and another reason to rest, to remember our creator is our savior and redeemer and our provider of a future. Every act of God on our behalf constitutes a reason why we should remember that is to reflect upon, acknowledge, and appreciate his love and care. It is God's purpose that on the Sabbath day, whatever interferes with the direct and personal fellowship between us and our Savior should be laid aside to become better acquainted with our Father in heaven, whom to know is life eternal, as it says in John 17, 3. Amen. That's ah. a very nice explanation mm -hmm. of uh, the meaning of the Sabbath. And of course, Byron, you are going to keep on talking about uh, uh, talking about the Sabbath, mm -hmm. keeping the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell us more. Why, how do we keep the Sabbath? Yeah, how huh? do we keep the Sabbath? Well, let's look at a little scripture. Let's start off at that. Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure exactly. on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, delight the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word. So that would be a list of negatives. <laughs> but then we get to verse 14. Then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I like verse 14 the best. It's the results of keeping the Sabbath holy. And actually, Psalms 92 is a reflection of Sabbath as well, but I just want to read verses 12 through 15. 
The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. To declare, and this is one I love the best, verse 15, to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. That's what the people who observe the Sabbath properly and find it a delight will say. So what is it about the Sabbath that brings so much joy? Well, first we're going to look at the fact that, you know, there's an extra blessing on Sabbath, right? But, you know, we were blessed in Eden mm -hmm. when the God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and, or that blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to look at an additional blessing. Mm -hmm. Ellen White writes in Christ in the Sabbath, page 20, but God in Christ never blessed any other day. He blesses man upon every day, but he has blessed only one day, and that is the seventh day. So when man, upon whom the blessing of God already rests, comes to the seventh day, upon which a blessing rests, there are two blessings, and both of them for man. The Sabbath was made for man, right? And so it is possible upon the seventh day of the week to enjoy a blessing which cannot be enjoyed upon any other day because it is not there. When the Sabbath goes by us, the Sabbath blessing goes along with it. So we look at this, a keeping it holy Sabbath observance will also sanctify us. This is our second point. We read Exodus 31, 13. But as you speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I almost want to add one comment to that. I am the Lord that saves you mm -hmm. through Sabbath. Because by sanctifying you, he is saving you and bringing you closer to salvation. We read in um, Ellen White and Christ in the Sabbath on page 21. We receive, because we're going to see just how this happens, the sanctification process. We receive the blessing of God on one Sabbath. The next one comes. And if we have been growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the blessing of the next Sabbath is an added blessing. It teaches us more and more of the power of God in creation and in redemption. We add to our experience, and it is a sign continually. I, Jehovah, am sanctifying you, making you holy. Thus, it appears again that the blessing of the Sabbath is the blessing of sanctification. So, you look at this, it is a loop. So I observe Sabbath properly. I put God as my priority, and I receive a blessing. I carry that blessing and grace to the next Sabbath, and it gets added to more. I carry it in the next one. And so it continually grows and sanctifies. Sabbath truly is an excellent way to be, to be saved, observing it and abiding in God. And we see this process the more time you spend with God in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. I love that. God is building us once again into what we once were before we fell. By beholding that glory each Sabbath, we are transformed from glory to glory. So the question is, on Sabbath, who are you spending time with? Who are you beholding? Because you will transform into whatever you are beholding. And if it's not God, it's definitely not a blessing. The lesson also tells us, talks to us about building family bonds. And that is good. But I'm going to go one step further here. Are you 
Well, isn't it excellent to spend time with fellow believers? We read in Matthew 12, 48 and 50, through 50, but Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. You know, in English, there's a phrase that blood is thicker than water. I'm going to actually have, try to counter that with a new phrase. God is thicker than blood. Because if your family members, and don't get me wrong, if your family members have not given themselves to Christ, they should be your top mission field, if, if at all possible. Because even Ellen White writes of that. It's often neglected, but we should make sure the ones we love most on this earth are saved for the eternal kingdom. But we're all part of the family of God, part of the body. And Sabbath is a time to nurture and grow those relationships in Christ Jesus and to share the gospel with others that may join in our joy. We're here to build and edify one another and to build each other up, but also to bring people to that joy that we found in Christ. So I have a question for you about the Sabbath. For everyone who's watching, how do you keep it? And this is just for you to reflect upon. How do you spend your time? Where are you in your Sabbath journey? I'll tell you my Sabbath journey. I started off with the list of things I couldn't do. Oh, it's the best day of the week. It's Saturday. What are you doing to me? It's a burden. And literally, it was ruining my life. I said it several times, probably much more than that. Later, I began to appreciate not working since I worked six days a week, too much at that time. And I was on call 24-7. Sabbath was my true day off. Then I began to realize that this is God's holy day, and I didn't want to do certain things because of reverence for God. It wasn't just rules, it was honoring the day. Then I started reading the Bible a lot more and realizing these things that maybe perhaps I had to change. And then when you start teaching Sabbath school, oh, that's a whole new level of conviction. And finally though, when you get down to it, you realize that you do it because you love God and you don't want to disappoint him. You don't say, oh, I can't do this. You say, why would I do that? Because it shouldn't even cross your mind. So I don't know which one of those stages one, any of us might be at, but it's something to think about because that is where we want to be is number four. You love God and you do it for him. So Reflecting on that, to build or to grow a relationship with God is really what we have that day for. It is, as I've heard it mentioned, date day with God. Now, if you have that special someone, you put aside everything to meet them. But yet, how many times do we put us everything and anything in front of God, which hinders us from being transformed into his image? And once we are transformed into his image, or if we progress in that, we can reflect his glory and character to others that they truly might have the blessing that we've received. I'll tell you, even on a week at Sabbath school, when you're doing the lesson and it's all hectic, it's still a blessing because you learn more about God and it still draws you closer to him. So are you looking forward to Sabbath? Are you looking special or forward to that special time with the Almighty? And wherever you are in your Sabbath journey, just remember the sooner the better because the sooner you come to him and spend time with him, the sooner he can start transforming you so that you can make a holy Sabbath part of your rhythms of rest. Amen. Thank you so much, Byron. I, I appreciate immensely that you brought your own experience, mm -hmm. your, your own journey. We've all been there. And, uh, well, we've said. all been there. Absolutely mm -hmm. right. And so thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Byron, for your contributions. I just want to um, bring this all in, in a summary, uh, in a summary manner, bring this all to, to a conclusion. Some final thoughts. 
You know, as I was praying to the Lord, uh, how would I finish the Sabbath school? Quite a lot of things came through my mind. Uh, I thought in making an appeal, perhaps, perhaps, um, talking to you a little bit about conviction. But I, I, I think that's the thing that I want to do tonight, uh, that this morning, is really to revisit the lesson and just pick up a few points for us to remember. You know, the first thing, uh, and Byron, you, you read Exodus chapter 20, verses 8, 11. And as we read the commandment, the Sabbath commandment, the first, the first word of that commandment is remember. God has a purpose for us when he says remember. You see, God, God has the Sabbath, and the Sabbath points back to a God who created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. The Sabbath points us to a creator who created us with a purpose. We were just not created, but we were created in God's image with a purpose and a mission. The Sabbath reminds us of the one who has provided all the good things of life for us. Tuesday's lesson was dedicated to that. In the wilderness for 40 years, getting manna on six days, and the sixth day you picked up a double portion because of Sabbath. Because Sabbath is a day of rest, a holy day. The Sabbath is an eternal symbol of our rest in God. We read in Ezekiel chapter 12, uh, 20, verses 12 and 20, Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath, says, says the Lord, to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. You have heard that word. Daniel spoke about it. Byron spoke about it. The Sabbath speaks about it. Hello, my Sabbath, says the Lord, verse 20. And they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. It's a sign. It bonds us. It's fellowship with our Creator. The Sabbath reveals that true rest from righteousness by works. Yes, you hear me, you hear me right? Righteousness by works can only be found in Jesus Christ, our Creator and Redeemer. And you and I attempt that every day. And the Lord's saying, no, Victor. Righteousness by works. You will find it in me only. And it is as, as a redeemer, as a creator. It is a sign of God's transforming power. God's righteousness transforms us. It is a sign of holiness and sanctification. God's holiness and sanctification transforms us. The Sabbath speaks of a God who has achieved. God, our Creator, your God and my God, has achieved. So that we can rest in His achievements. You see, the Sabbath points back to Christ's rest on the tomb. The rest of victory over sin. And offers to the Christian a tangible opportunity to access and experience Christ's forgiveness. His peace and His rest. The Sabbath rest is the rest of grace in the loving arms of a God who created us, of a God who has redeemed us, of a God who is coming again for us very soon. You know, at the end of the day, my friend, my brother, and my sister, Sabbath keeping, Sabbath keeping, going to Sabbath on a regular basis, every Sabbath, Sabbath keeping reveals that we have ceased to depend on our own works and that we realize that only Christ, the Creator, can save. The spirit of true Sabbath keeping. So Sabbath keeping realizes that we no longer depend on ourselves, but we depend on God. But the spirit of true Sabbath keeping reveals a supreme love for Jesus Christ. Why do you go to church on Sabbath? Because you love your Creator. True love. The Creator and Savior who is making us into a new person fit for heaven. Amen. This was a very important lesson. It's refreshed my commitment 
not only to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, but to go to, to church on every Sabbath so that I can fellowship with him and my fellow man. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for creation. For by the seventh day, as Byron stated, you completed creation with a day of rest that was permanently placed in our lives for eternity. Lord, thank you. Thank you that in that day, you have victoriously, victoriously won the battle for each one. On that day, everything that you've done for us can be ours. On that day, Lord, a day of fellowship, we can rejoice in a God that provides, a God that has created, a God that has redeemed, and the God that is waiting to come to take us home into a new Jerusalem where we will be celebrating seven, Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath with Christ. Oh Lord, thank you for your amazing grace. Father, we want to ask you to bless us. We thank you for this day, the Sabbath day. And we thank you, Father, for the knowledge and the understanding that you've given us for your love, and Lord, for your amazing grace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Have a blessed day.